I, I want to I want to focus on the main stuff, but let me go through a few things. First thing, the way this started, uh, Julian gets, uh, you know, I guess credit if that's the right word. Uh, I was approached by Occupy uh, because of what was going on at Phoenix Square, and uh, Occupy uh, wanted legal representation. I am a lawyer, but I'm a member of the Law Society of Alberta. Originally, the way this started is that. I said, well, I'll consider the possibility of acting for Occupy. Uh, since that time, one of the, I guess, the, the sublines here is, I have contacted the Law Society of Brunswick, which informs me I cannot act for, for uh, Occupy. And I have a bit of an issue with the Law Society on that. But, uh, but that's how this started. This started because there was uh, stuff going down at uh, Phoenix Square, everyone was concerned, of course, that the city was going to step in. Everyone was wondering why the city hadn't stepped uh, in. Uh, there are, so I put a few disclaimers down. Uh, what really comes out of this, uh, you could just look at that. I wanted to give people something because you should work through this yourself at home once we go through it. But this, this case doesn't end up where I thought it ended up. Uh, I got involved, I teach the Charter of Rights, and uh, I have a long-standing interest, I have a PhD in philosophy, and I have a long-standing interest in the relationship between law and politics. And uh, obviously that's front and center here. And I was originally concerned about, and I know Occupy was concerned about, uh, freedom of expression, so section two of the Charter. There is a very interesting legal side to this. I'm sure there's American case law, which would suggest that uh, freedom of expression, which is, and, and, and political expression gets, um, uh, is protected, and has a higher degree of protection under the charter than normal forms of expression. But there was this interesting issue that, uh, I don't know if encampment is the right word, Julie might not like that, but the shelter and the sign down at Phoenix Square work in some, you know, the occupation of Phoenix Square was itself some form of uh, political expression protected by the Charter of Rights, and so the city can't move in, or at least there, there are restrictions. So that's how I got involved in it. And there are major issues there. And uh, it's interesting because you had occupations across the country, but really from what I have seen, I haven't spent a lot of time on it, but I have been following it. The courts have not dealt with these issues. And yes, I think as a lawyer and as an academic and someone who teaches the charter is concerned about the charter, those issues have to be dealt with. But what happened in this case, this isn't what I'm here to talk about today, because as you'll see, uh, there's more going on. And uh, unfortunately, uh, at least I say unfortunately, uh, this has to do with the fact that the city was less than forthright in the way that it dealt with this matter. So let me go, uh, I put down the facts, so you've got some disclaimers, I just want to be clear who I am. Uh, I guess I, given what the Law Society of New Brunswick says, I'm not acting for Occupy. I put down the facts, just so you know, the facts as I understand it, it's basically you go, any judge or even an expert witness, the first, in the court, and the first thing you do is say, okay, here are the facts. So those are the facts that is that you can look at them as you want. Uh, what I really want to focus on, I'll say something about the legal issue, but what I want to focus on is the bylaw. That, uh, section 5 of the bylaw, uh, which is what the city uh, ostensibly uh, fell back on or relied on when they moved in shelter and sign. I added the, uh, you have the letter from there, uh, you have the notice uh, from the direct commissioner. The notice is of particular significance. The way this started, actually I wasn't here, I wasn't going to mention it, but Julian's already mentioned it. I was actually in Tokyo at the time, uh, and, but I got, I think, an urgent email from uh, Julian and he faxed me or he sent me uh, as an attachment uh, the letter, the notice. And he was just, this is before the city uh, moved in and uh, asked me to look at it and was concerned about it. And he was, of 
course, he was in. Wanted to know whether there are legal issues with uh, respect to. I think he was more concerned about the the, um, the letter. My concerns with the notice. I think what's significant in this case is the notice because the notice is issued under Section Five by law. Uh, the director of engineering was just in issuing this notice. This is an official act under the bylaw, uh, and I think as a result attracts what I would call legal scrutiny. So when I got the notice, I looked at the letter, I looked at the notice, I was initially concerned because if you actually look at the notice, you can do that in your own time, but uh, it doesn't, um, it basically, it seems to be suggesting, maybe I should say the letter, the notice together seem to be saying you have to leave or you have to take down the shelter of the sign and uh, uh, exit uh, Phoenix Square. Uh, but legally, it's, it's very problematic because I had, uh, if I could say so, a devil of the time understanding why. If you look at the notice, it doesn't uh, say why uh, Occupy Fredericton has to leave Phoenix Square. And that's a fundamental legal requirement. Uh, it's what we call natural justice. The press has been using the term eviction. I don't really like the term eviction, but if you want to use that term, uh, and I don't like it because it's landlord and tenant, but if you want to use that kind of term, if your landlord's going to kick you out, he has to tell you why. Very basic, you know, and uh, there's no issue about this. Yes. What, what word would you use instead of eviction? I just don't. Uh, you can ask me. Why don't I go through it? And then, sure, if you want to ask me, I'm happy to. Uh, the reason I don't, I, I don't want to go with the two sides. I don't like it because it suggested that Occupy Fredericton was there. I'm going to use a legal term with the pleasure of the city. You know that. It, that the, 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 the city, uh, because there are deep political issues here, deep really constitutional issues under the Charter, if, if occupying uh, Fredericton had a right to be in Phoenix Square, you shouldn't be calling it, uh, it's not a land or tenant kind of situation. There's something, it, it just, it doesn't really catch what's going on, because they have a right to be there. Presumably, if you have if the landlord and tenant, you're the tenant, I guess you paid the rent, so that's why you, it's a different kind of situation. But it, it is similar in the sense, as I say, if you're going to call it an eviction, if someone is going to evict, they tell you why. So that's where they start off. And so, uh, and my concern is read the notice, because the notice is the official document under the Act. Uh, in fact, I think, you know, the letter, I don't know what the letter constitutes, it's a political act. But, uh, and it was very careful, at least as far as I can see, it was very carefully uh, crafted and, uh, and less than forthright. But, uh, so I started with the notice, I said, and I, did, I was in correspondence with uh, Julian. I said, well, you know, this notice looks deficient to me. I am a courtroom boy, if you haven't picked up on that. So, I mean, I know, you know, what is needed in a, you know, to satisfy a court in terms of, you know, legal notice, obviously. So, uh, and I actually remember asking Julian, uh, well, why are they kicking on Phoenix Square? Why are you getting, you know, told to leave? And the truth is, and Julian can correct me if I'm wrong, I don't think Julian knows, and I don't think I know, because what happened after that is Julian on its own, but I as well, went through the Bible. And I've been through, Julian's been through more than I have. I think Julian will tell you that he's been through every section of the bylaw at length, more than once. I have been through the bylaw. I have yet to understand what there is in the bylaw that gave the city the authority to remove the protesters from doing so. Now, there's more to it than that. And that's where, in a way, it gets interesting. Uh, it ends up, um, you know, it's really a, a case of forensics, legal forensics. It was only at a later point in time, although this is very obvious once you figured it out, it was only at a later point in time 
And you have to understand, the way I come, and I am a lawyer, and I was a girl, and I've seen a lot of uh, inappropriate behavior, but I, you know, when I look at this situation as a lawyer, I start off on, you know, obviously the city has a legal department, the city solicitor, and I'm working on the assumption uh, that they're working with and you know, so basically, there was a, 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 I don't know, a couple of weeks went by, and Julian and I are both trying to figure out what's going on. Of course, at a certain point, the city moves in. The city moves in. It's not pursuant to the notice. And the Julian's not even aware of it. They give you three days' notice, really in law, because notice always starts a day late because we have to be sure um, they did not give the protest. So you bait, you know, when I first saw the notice, I'm thinking, okay, this is a notice, and basically what they're saying is you've got three days to move out and we're going to take you down. It's not actually what the notice says, but that's what I thought we were talking about. Well, of course, they don't wait three days. They come in in two days, basically, or two and a half days, and take down the, uh, uh, the shelter and the sign. Uh, and actually, when you read the notice carefully, the notice doesn't say you've got three days to move or we're going to take down the shelter. What the notice says is you have three days to move or we're going to charge you on the bylaw, section 16 of the bylaw. Uh, of course, no one was charged on the bylaw. Now, you know, the, the, pro the real problem for me as, uh, I suppose, a, a professor, I mean, an academic looking at this and a lawyer, is the city has not been forthright. It hasn't come forward and explained what's going on here, but uh, I suspect, as far as I can see, and I have spent a considerable amount of time on this, the reason no one was charged under the file was because there wasn't a violation of the file, which of course raises issues about why was the director of engineering issuing notice to the protesters that if you don't remove yourselves within three days, we're going to charge you on the bylaw if there's no if there's no violation of the bylaw. And so, you know, it takes a while to go through it, but at a certain point, as I said to you in the night, the penny drops, which is there's a problem with the bylaw. It turns out, and this is uh, I practice law for over thirty years. This is the first time I have ever come across this. But uh, quite frankly, uh, and, uh, I really, I mean, we need to hear from the city. The city has not been forthright about this, but uh, there's a piece missing. It's bizarre. I, I, as I say, I, you know, I would have in my career, I mean, I was on the Human Rights Tribunal. You know, all I did was interpret legislation, was look at legislation and figure out what it said. What it, Something went wrong when they passed bylaw T4, and they didn't pass. I assume, I, you know, I'm only speculating, but I, someone left something up, and it's a bizarre situation because it's very clear. There's no, I, I, I'm very interested to hear what the city solicitor has to say about it, but there is a provision I gather that was supposed to be in section five which isn't in Section 5, which never somehow made it through into the official bylaw. And that provision, which is the missing provision, is what they were, uh, is what Occupy Fredericton is alleged to have violated. It doesn't exist. So what I did, I just tried to do it as simply as possible. You look at page two. So what I give you is, I give you the, the Bible. There's really, you have to look at this. This is a standard legislative scheme. Uh, the way this works is uh, it's basically an offense creating provision or provisions. Uh, the, there's actually two provisions one is section 5, one is section 16, 16 the penalty clause. But the way this is supposed to work, if you look at page 2 and on to page 3, this is. This is, uh, if you want a legislative scheme that comes in three parts. You have, a, you have a, a part, a provision that says to the public or to whoever, you can't do this. Really, the, the, at its simplest, it's two parts. You tell the public they can't do something, and then you provide a penalty if they do it. 
this is a little more complicated because we're talking about private property. And uh, of course, I know legislation, and they're concerned about, you know, the reason you got this three-day notice is that if someone's got something up somewhere where it shouldn't be, you have to give them a, a fair opportunity to take it down. That's, that's what's going on there. But that, that's really a very secondary uh, consideration or, or cause. The, the, real, the real heart of it is you've got a provision which creates an offense, and then you've got a penalty clause which says if someone uh, does what the substantive clause, the first part says you can't do, they get penalized. I, I mean this quite literally. The first part of the section is missing. Absolutely. The substantive clause isn't there. Now, what, uh, why? Of course, I, how can I know? Uh, as I say, um, you know, the bylaw must have been passed. It must have been transcribed. Uh, somehow, uh, I gather, and really the mayor needs to answer this, and the city solicitor needs to answer this question. Uh, uh, the city solicitor will be able to tell us why that part of section five, which they appear to have been relying on, never made it into the final bylaw. My guess is just to clear it clear. But really, I'm not that concerned about that. What concerns me is you have a defective piece of legislation. Of legislation. You have a defective bylaw. Section 5 does not contain the provision on which the mayor was ostensibly relying in order to uh, order uh, 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 the protesters out of Phoenix Park. Now, it's interesting when you realize this, it starts to explain why the city waited. Probably explains why the city. I suspect what happened. Obviously, the city solicitor is a lawyer. The city solicitor would be much more familiar with this uh, uh, legislation than I would be. But the city solicitor, I would assume, must have been aware. In fact, the person who drew up that notice must have been aware that there was a problem with Section 5. And that, uh, you know, what you've got is the critical piece of Section 5 isn't there. Well, this is law, of course. You can't charge people with an offense or under a provision that does not exist. But that's what they were threatening to do. So it's, uh, it's, uh, now why uh, didn't they come clean about this? You know, and in fact, I know the mayor made comments about, well, maybe we'll have to strengthen the bylaw. Uh, there's something missing from the bylaw. So if they, if they were gonna somehow come under section five, yes, they first needed to amend the bylaw. Uh, you know, go before council, amend the bylaw, put in the missing piece, and then you can, but, you know, it, I was trying to think of analogies. It's been something like that, and I'm mostly concerned legally about the notice. I have a very hard time understanding how the director of engineering had any authority to issue this notice. I, I'm, uh, it's, and I assume the director of engineering must have spoken to the city solicitor. That's why you have a city solicitor. They have a legal department. They must have been aware of it. I would have thought, in normal circumstances, that it's the city solicitor who drafts the notice. Or at least someone under the city solicitor. You see, because when you draft the notice, if you do what you're supposed to be doing legally, you say, okay, we've got some people, and they're doing something they shouldn't do. Let's. You know, it's time to issue the notice under the bylaw. What you do is you say, okay, how, you have to tell them how they violated the bylaw. Well, of course, they, the notice doesn't say how they, because there's nothing in the bylaw to violate. If you want to, you know, this is a guess. And, and uh, you know, I'm troubled by this, but the mayor's letter, you can see that what the mayor is doing, and it's, I don't know what word to use, coy. If you look at the mayor's letter, uh, the last, um, I'm just trying to see. Uh, it, well, I, I can't find it at this moment, but basically, uh, 
Well, let's just look at the mayor's letter. You look at the mayor's letters, and there's an issue about installing, erecting, or maintaining a building or other structure in contravention of Section 5. There is nothing in Section 5 that says you cannot install, erect, or maintain a building or other structure on the site. So is that, is that first section there just rubbish? It doesn't... In his letter? This, this first part that you just referenced to. Uh, that, that's in his letter. This section five. Well, what he's doing is he's implying that there is a provision in section five which says you cannot install, erect, or maintain a structure on a sidewalk or a street. Uh, you've got section five. You're welcome to look at section five. When you look at section five, what you're looking at is you see I put the, the section five is defective one, two, three. All you've got to section five is number two. Number one, which is the substantive clause, which said there should have been a provision. I gather it's for the mayor to say, but I gather there there was uh, perhaps an intention to put in the, in the. Well, I assume there was an intention to put in section five a provision that says you cannot ins install, erect, or maintain a structure on city property without the permission. Something. It's not there. This is not. You know, and I, I'm concerned that people underestimate this. This, we're talking, you know, these are, uh, there's a penalty associated with this. Obviously, you can't, uh, 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 you can't charge and obviously convict people of a provision which has not been, in, you know, for whatever reason included in the Bible. What I was going to use as an example is, uh, it's like a police officer because the notice isn't a charge but it's very close, and it's an official act issuing the notice. It is like a police officer giving you a written notice uh, for violating a section that does not exist. That's what's going on. And it's just, of course it's bizarre. I don't know if Mayor Brad Woodside, because I have since discovered through the offices of Julian that it was Mayor Woodside who was the mayor when this legislation so whether I'm whether this is sheer embarrassment because they've got a defective bylaw and they can't I don't know uh, what should they have done of course they should have come clean they should have been honest and forthright about the matter and said you know the truth of the matter is we've got a problem with the bylaw we don't know how this happened but somehow and I must say as a lawyer standing on the sidelines there's nothing to do with Occupy I was wondering why it went on and on for three months and they didn't do it. I know why they didn't do anything. The reason they didn't do anything is the provision that is supposed to deal with this is dead. But what the city should have done, I mean, this is all subject to what they say because they have not come clean about this. What the city should have done is said, we have a problem with the bylaws. Somehow, it's an embarrassing situation. Actually, I don't think it's that embarrassing myself. I'm a lawyer. There are what? There are 10 million legislative provisions out. Someone is going to make a mistake somewhere along the way. Someone made a mistake. It's a clear, clear. I assume it was a clear. They needed to just uh, fess up and own up to it. So we've got a problem with the bylaw. Uh, Given the bylaw, the per we, we're, we don't have a bylaw which prohibits uh, uh, Occupy or anyone else from erecting, maintaining a, a structure on a city street. We better deal with that. We'll deal with that and come back. There is another alternative, which is what I feel they should have done, which is they should have gone to the court of inspection. They still have that available to them. I mean, in some sense, they have custody, obviously, in some legal sense of streets and roads. But what acted, in terms of the letter and the notice, and then what were they acting on the notice? Is that what's going on here? Two and a half days later, of course, it's. It's not, they don't even wait the three days, but they ostensibly come in and dismantle the shelter and take it down around the ears of the people inside it. Uh, what's the authority for doing so? The way it's written in the letter of the notice is their authority for doing so is section five, but this, the piece of section five, it's not there. You know, it. As a lawyer, you read this, and I just kept reading, go through the bylaw, and I just couldn't figure this out. It didn't make sense. And then I suddenly realized there's a piece missing from section five. That's what. And the mayor was.
was not open about that and didn't complain about that. And really what's going on with the notice and the letters, they're finessing the issue in there. But it certainly looks, I, I would be very interested. I would, I would like to hear from the mayor of the city solicitor and the director of engineering. This letter of notice looked like the city's pretending there is a piece in section five which isn't there. And they're actually, as I say, they're, they're threatening to charge the protesters for violating the provision which is not there, which doesn't exist, which isn't part of it. So, uh, so what happens is, uh, so that's um, where we end up. If the, let me just go through. There are all sorts of other legal issues. And I have to say, uh, sure, uh, I'm a litigation lawyer. Uh, I was in the courts for over 20 years. And I remember, I have a hard time understanding where the city, how the city had the authority to take down the shelter. After they took it down, they also took it to pieces. I would take the you can get into all sorts of technical issues, but I would take the position that it was not their property, it was the property of someone else. Uh, they had no right, as, as far as I could see, to destroy it. They had to return it. Uh, so there are, uh, there are all sorts of legal, and I haven't even talked about the issues on the return. Because what happens is when you start looking to this and you find and figure out what happened is you've got a different kind of issue, which is I don't feel it's appropriate for someone in a political office to misrepresent them, which is what's happening. You have someone, this is the chief uh, officer, political officer for the city. This is a person in a, a very high political position who is suggesting very clearly, uh, pretending I mean, it's it's really uh, it's hard. I'm still incredulous, and so there's an issue, and I have to wonder. And this isn't what really what I was asked to, and it's not what interests. What interests me is the law and what happened here legally. But I come out of it, and there are I've listed a number of other legal issues, and there is a there are provisions under the Municipalities Act which could easily have been used. I mean, maybe they're going to get into a, a fight about it because whether it's private or public property. But lo and behold, when you start looking into the situation, the Municipalities Act has provisions for to deal with uh, removing unsightly or hazardous premises. So it's not like there's you know no modus operandi available to the city to deal with the situation. Uh, and of course, the the Municipalities Act, what you basically if there's a fight about it, if there's an issue, it's go before the judge the court of the bench. And of course, Occupy wouldn't, was fine with that. My understanding is Occupy made it very clear to the mayor, if you want to go to court, let's go to court. We have constitutional issues that we want to raise. We want to put this in front of a judge, give a judge, you know. Why would the city do this? Instead of, uh, and of course, my own view, and I, I, I'm a senior member, my own view. What would? Why? I, I have a hard time understanding. I mean, there's something wrong here, in that it's uh, politics running the show instead of law. These are legal issues. I, I have a very hard time as someone who asked perhaps to come forth there. Why didn't they just go to? Uh, all they had to do was do a notice of motion, put the matter in front of the judge in the court of Queen's bench, and say we have a problem with our life. Something went wrong somehow. It's a bit of an embarrassment, but they're, quite frankly, uh, we have a few our bylaws. We don't have a provision. We don't have any anything in our bylaws that deals with this situation. Uh, a judge on the, Supreme Court, uh, on, the, on the Court of Queen's Bench has inherent jurisdiction. A judge on the Court of Queen's Bench can still, if the judge uh, feels that they have to move, he can order them to move. I mean, you could still deal with it. But uh, there's no need for uh, you know, this kind of pretense. And, and I, I'm deeply, uh, I would even so, because my own interest is, 
And I, there's a disturbing trend here. This isn't just Fredericton. In the last 15 years, you see people in political office and they don't feel obliged to follow the, what I would say, the rule of law. There's a, there is a bylaw that is supposed to deal with these kinds of situations. And because it doesn't have the necessary provision to deal with it, you basically uh, fake it. You pretend it's there, and, and actually, you actually issue a legal notice under the bylaw. The director of engineering is in the worst position. It's an excuse. If I, 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 there are questions that need to be answered. So, so uh, there are a number of other legal issues. Uh, I still. Minor issue, but still, it, I shouldn't even say it's minor. Under the bylaw, if you do move under the bylaw, if you take down the sign, you have to hold on to it for seven days. The bylaw says this explicitly. This is because people, if someone has the sign, they put effort and money into putting the sign together. If the city seizes someone's signs, they have to hold on. Did they in this case? No. Did they wait seven days? No, within three days it was destroyed. It's a violation of the bylaw. The city is, is you know, uh, so it, to, in my perception of the situation is that uh, uh, politics, uh, you know, this is raw politics. And you, you have to understand, if you don't have section five, so you can't go in and take down the shelter and the sign on the base section five, uh, and you don't have anything else, you're acting outside the law, which means it's brute force. That's all. You know, the, 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 whether it is the police or a city crew, I mean, they actually took uh, chainsaws, and as I said, there were people inside and, and took the, what gives you the authority to do that? And if they don't have the legal authority to do that, uh, is that any different than I decide to take a chainsaw to, and take someone, I, I, I'm having a hard time. So uh, at the very least, they were in a very difficult, awkward situation legally. That's exactly the situation where you go to a judge. And of course, if they had gone to a judge, then Occupy gets the, has the opportunity to raise the constitutional issue section to the charge. It all gets proper. But they just weren't, you know, this is about people in political office refusing to deal with legal issues uh, appropriately and according to the rules. I was going to say, uh, uh, under the Charter of Rights, I don't know if you know, the preamble of Charter of Rights starts off Canada, it's founded on principles that recognize the supremacy of God and the rule of law. And the rule of law, it, this goes back to the 1600s, it goes back to Edward Cook and James I. Point is, you're a king, you're a mayor, you're a premier, you're subject to law. You have to follow the procedures, the legal uh, provisions, procedures set out in the relevant legislation. And they didn't. In fact, but it's worse than that because what they did is they misrepresented the situation. And, you know, really, his letter, the mayor's letter, his conduct, what he's doing in a sense, sort of conceptually, is he's amending the, the bylaw. What well, he has no authority. You know, if you want to amend the bylaw, take it back before city council. So that's the situation. So you understand. There, as I say, there are lots of other legal issues in there. The constitutional issues. Uh, but uh, on my way to sort out the constitutional issues, of course, I discover really what's going on is you've got a defective bylaw. The city is holding up to it. As, as I say, the mayor and the director of engineering, and I'm concerned about the actions of the city system. I don't even mind. I don't like being on the record here, but I just don't like people taking my picture. But if I'm a city solicitor, I would not. Why did the city, I will give you three questions. Why did the mayor suggest that there's a violation of section five if there isn't? Uh, what authority did the director of engineering have to issue the notice if it's not there? If there's no section five violation because the piece is missing? But, and for myself personally, because I am a lawyer, I'm deeply concerned about the rule of law. Why did the city solicitor allow the director of the mayor to proceed under the city? Surely there were discussions the mayor. I, I don't know, I, but I, I can't answer this. If I'm the director of engineering, I would assume that I go to the city solicitor or to the department to say, okay, just give me a notice. I assume they draft it up. Uh, uh, to be honest, 
just as a fair-minded person, when you read the notice you're about to sign, it doesn't say anything. Believe me, read that notice. It you're going to say, well, shouldn't we tell them why they have to move? Why did they have to? So, something went wrong here. You know? I mean, what happened? You know, the discussions between the city solicitor and the mayor and anyone are, are privileged, but uh, the city solicitor, I would assume, had to look. They, as soon as that shelter was set up, the city solicitor, the city solicitor's department will look into the situation. Someone uh, was told, do a brief, take a look at the cases. Give me, you know, tell us what the law is. Take a look at the bond. I, I, if the city solicitor was not aware of the situation, If the city solicitor was aware of the situation, surely what you say as a lawyer, that every lawyer is an officer of the court. You have a duty to uphold the law. So if you're the city solicitor and you're aware of the situation as a professional side to this, you say, we can't this the law. I mean, this is what, we're, this is what the bylaw says. We're stuck with the bylaw. That's what it is. We're, so why? You know, and, and you, Mr. Mayor, are, I'm not going to permit you to see this list or to misrepresent it and to pretend that there's a permit. And so what, something went wrong here, deeply wrong. Yes? I have a couple of questions. Sure. Um, first off, if there was the fifth provision in that bylaw. So the first provision, part A, the substantive. The law. one that he referred to. Yeah. Even if that was there, how can you use a bylaw to overturn or deny a constitutionally protected freedom? Well, it goes the other way. You start with the bylaw. But my simple answer to that is, you know, I am a lawyer and I care deeply about this. You, I'm not interested in it if the provision was there. The provision is not there. And, you know, maybe in politics you could say if, a, if this is serious stuff. People, in fact, the, in terms of a, a pretense, and why did they come in at two and a half? Suppose they had a notice. They said you've got three days. If you don't go, if you don't leave in three days, we're going to charge you. Well, if three days had elapsed, and then they would be in the embarrassing position of charging someone with an offense that does not exist, I would suggest to you that that's probably why they went in before the three days had elapsed. So you, you, you know, uh, I don't have. If there is a bylaw, and the bylaw applies, and they and they. Act on the bylaw, fine. I think if there's an important constitutional issue, they have to let the people who are claiming constitutional rights, they, they should give them a proper opportunity to have that matter heard appropriately in the courts. But 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 you shouldn't be going down the path, even if that the provision is not there. That's where this starts with me. So, uh, and, uh, in order to charge someone with an offense, do you need a in the bylaw? Of course you do. It's it's because of that. Does that mean that the solicitor could have said no? I can't agree to do this because it it doesn't. Well, I, I hate the first person stuff, and I hate you know uh, second guessing people. Uh, unfortunately, I'm in a bad you know. I blame the city for this because the city hasn't been open about this. If I'm the city solicitor, I say, Mr. The, the city solicitor, although any conversation between the city solicitor and the mayor are privileged, but the city solicitor is in a, in, in a different position. I mean, the issue with the mayor is should a political figure be misrepresenting the law and acting in this kind of way? You know, uh, the issue with the director of engineering is where did you get the authority to issue How can you issue someone with a notice saying you're violating the bylaw when it's not there? But the issue for the city solicitor is the city solicitor has a duty, a professional duty to uphold the law. And is misrepresenting the law? No, of course not. I mean, that's, you know, the, the city solicitor should not. Now, I don't know what went on between the city solicitor and the mayor. Uh, maybe we have a term involved. Maybe the mayor was off on a frolic. But, I mean, you have a city crew, uh, you have to wonder, there had to be some kind of conversation. If I'm the city solicitor, I would have said, if you can't, I will not permit you to misrepresent the bylaw. 
uh, if you do misrepresent the bond, I will correct you, and I will correct you publicly, because as it is the city solicitor that represents the city, the city is not the bank. That's one of the problems here. Now, it was completely inappropriate from a legal point of view for the mayor to be down there with the crew. It's not the mayor's job. You have an, the city administrator, he's a political, he's the chief political officer for the city, he's not an administrator. This is a situation, I don't know, it looks like the mayor has far too much authority in City Hall and other people who have very specific legal roles aren't doing what they should be doing. But no, I don't think, uh, I think the city, as I say, I don't know what the discussions were, but I, as a, a professional matter, I cannot believe that the city solicitor was not aware of the situation. And if the city solicitor was aware of the situation, of course the city solicitor should have said we're working within the law. That's what this is about. And uh, why, and yes, I, now, I, you know, did the mayor put a crew together late one night and, you know, rush out the next morning without, But uh, the truth is, if I was the city solicitor, and I'm speaking, I, you know, I've been with the bar for 30 years, and I take my professional responsibility. If the mayor had done this and I was the city solicitor, I would have gone public after they had done this and corrected the record. This is an official record. I'm not going to stand by as the city solicitor, and uh, this is a, you know, I try to be as fair as I can. I need to hear from the mayor and the city solicitor and director of engineering. But this looks to me like a complete misrepresentation of um, what the, is in the bylaw and what the laws of the city of Fredericton say and should the city solicitor come. You have, of course, the city solicitor has a higher calling, a higher duty, which is to an officer of the court to represent the law accurately. You can, if, if the city solicitor had uh, taken this position, said you're in violation of section five of the provision which you're alleged to violate it isn't there, I would say that's a problem. I mean, how could you, you know? You know, the, the federal government forgets somehow to amend the criminal code and the Minister of Justice stands up and, you know, it speaks as if that the amendment went through. You can't, come on, I, this, and this is deep stuff. It's about rule of law and living in a society where, of course it's, it's not the lawyers, it's the politicians who run the show, and it should be, but they have to do so within the rule of law. So that's the issue. You can't be sending notices to people, you're in violation of a bylaw of a particular law without first assuring yourself that indeed they are. Well, how could they be? Because there's no bylaw. I, he's, I, if I was the direct, the, the fall guy here is the direct. Yeah, if they start rolling over on each other, he's the one who's going to be the scapegoat right now. If I was the director of engineering, certainly if I had, I had independent legal advice, I would not have signed. I would have refused to sign. Does he have any legal authority to even sign a letter like this? Not unless you violated a provision of the bylaw and you didn't violate any provision of the bylaw. No. So we're going. To, I am going to. This, and as I say, this this is a, a statutory act. This is an official act under the bylaw. Uh, it's it's not quite charging, but it's like you know, it's like the, the police officer does writes up a written notice saying that next time you're going, you know, don't breach this provision. Next time I'm going to charge you and sign. And there's the, and he knows the provision doesn't. How could? I mean, see, they have to speak to it. How, what was going through the director of engineering's mind when he wrote this? He probably didn't. He, he, well, I mean, he's well, if he's signing it blindly, that's just as bad. Right. As someone sending out notices that affect people's rights, you have no... But they're not legally trained either. I mean, they probably don't know that the... the you need to be legally trained when you're actually sending, giving someone a notice saying you will be charged with an offense under the act. Mm -hmm. But... Uh, I, Any, the, the courts would take the position, anyone who's doing that has to be aware that they cannot do so without good ground. Right. You have to have reasonable probable grounds to believe that someone has in fact violated the act. How can they have, how, where are the reasonable probable grounds to believe you violated the act? The provision you're supposed to violate, it doesn't exist. And they must have known that. Because well, that's what you wonder, right? And, and you don't think the city solicitor is going to save them, but 
But they have to deal with that. But it, I mean, so there, this, there's all sorts of um, this stuff. But these issues are, I also, these aren't strictly speaking legal issues. These are also political issues. The lack of judgment, the fact that people in positions of public, I even the director of engineering is in public, uh, feel that they can act in this kind of way is really deeply uh, distressing. How about telling the truth? The question of confidence, like these, these, they put this thing through, and well, I think he was concerned any, about that. Nobody at any point. Was like, well, oh, I understand why you would say that, and that's what he's thinking. But you know, I am sure. Uh, what are there? Ten million pieces of legislation across the country. I'm sure you could go find another piece of legislation where someone's made a. You know, if you if you write enough pieces of legislation, someone's going to make a mistake. It is embarrassing. You know, in fact, they should have caught it before uh, uh, Occupy. How when was the bylaw passed? I think 2002. You uh, would oh, have. I'm going to check the original because there were amendments made after, and I checked the amendments. See, when they did the amendments, did not fix the problem. So was it that the? I would be very careful. With this is very important stuff, actually, yeah, yeah. because because. because these, this is the official um, bylaw, so the mayor can't come up with another bylaw. This is actually very anal original. a bit, that's what you're thinking. Originally passed June 28, 2004. Yeah. The seal and signature. So the I'm here to tell you, I you know, Julian, it's too bad I should have said that to you, CBC fellow. Between 2004 and now, someone should have figured out that this <laughs> yeah. should have fixed the bylaw. Yeah, the most recent amendment was bylaw T 4.2 made November 23rd, 2009. Yeah, great. It's gone all this time and nobody knows. The solicitor didn't notice. The mayor didn't notice. The engineer didn't notice. What does it say? Well, and you, wonder, doing? you yeah. wonder too that they didn't have some homeless guy put up a tent on the street somewhere or someone got upset about it. The business said, we need this guy moved on. They would have had to, you know, it, it is pretty, it's amateur hour. It, it, it is. But but I, I, I really think that the real amateur stuff is not only everybody. My question is, it, like, what happened to that yeah. that um, supposed fifth provision? provision? Did they uh, propose it at first and then it didn't go I through? I don't know. <laughs> That's, I don't know what was the reason. Because they must have known at that time. Well, I think the person who can answer that question can say so. Because that, they must have looked into this. I, I think Brad Woodside must know. It's not for people in political office, and as they say, it was completely inappropriate for the mayor to be there. So he's going to take his voice and go down. This is someone who's acting outside the yeah. And uh, can you use can you use force against other people in society? No. You have to have a lead. You know, there has to be a law there that says in this situation the use of force is allowed. You look at the medievals, the med you know, because the, the history of the of our legal system. And he was force out, force outside the rule of law's violence. And he's lucky that there wasn't a, a nasty situation. Someone's head did get bumped. By well, that's right too. I think that and there's a, there's a lawsuit there. Someone yeah. wants it. I mean, it's, yeah, but just get someone ahead of the board and not expect not to. But don't you agree? It's lucky it wasn't a lot worse. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But it's uh, the um, but the real sad part of it is. They feel they've got away with it, and nothing's happened, and no one's come forward, and, and Occupy doesn't have legal representation. It's all just, it's really, I'm sorry, but the really sad side of this is that it just seems to happen, and they get away with it. Now, we don't have any kind of legal support. Do you understand at all? Yeah. Right now, no. We've approached a couple of lawyers, and they kind of. Are they even willing away. to consider what just happened in bylaw? <clears throat> Um, they, Blair, or are they Blair, here? what's his name, was going to represent us if we had gotten arrested. Yeah. Uh, L.A. Henry has shown some But are they not reading the bylaw? I'm, I'm not, I don't think they have. I don't think they're fully apprised of the situation. Oh, no, they, they, they don't want to figure this out. No. Yeah, so, and that's one reason why today it was important to really get the information out there. So with this information, if we approach someone, we might have a better chance to find legal representation. Well, I, well and I put it all down so that yeah, you've got a piece yeah, of paper. Yeah. And it's they don't have to do any work at all. I'll be it's honest with you. I'll be honest with you. This case, if it goes, is a historic case. Yeah. 
be not a, don't be hurt, but the amount of, you know, the property, the value, it's true. Yeah. Utterly true. But there is a very important legal point in here, which is that a person in political office cannot misrepresent the law, and that uh, uh, in this situation, he was acting outside the law, and therefore there is uh, in liability. In more than one sense, in more than one sense, not just with the bylaw and misrepresenting it, but also, you know, going beyond Ignoring what the bylaw the says. Yeah. Like well, the city solicitor should have been saying to the mayor, you can't go against these people just because you've got an issue with them, because you don't like them, because they're, you know, embarrassing you. You have to have a legal reason. You have to have legal authority. Where is it? And uh, it would be a good object lesson for people in political office, you know. And as a, I mean, the really bizarre part of it, do, personally, is what do I think it was hard to go before the court? No, it wasn't hard. Would the time of year have something to do with it? Because it was right around. Well, the real it. issue which the press should figure out is that you really had best get your, Why did he change? Why did he change his mind? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because yeah, at first. He yeah. actually exposed himself to liability here. Why? You see, what makes sense to me is what happened at the beginning of the three months. Like not doing anything. So they find themselves in this situation, let's use a colloquial expression, with their caught with their pants down, you know? They, well, right, and they don't, you know, the, because, and I must say, I wonder just sitting here teaching and following the news, why isn't the city moving against these people? And I remember saying this, there has to be a bylaw that says you can't camp on a city street or something. So, of course, there isn't. That's why they didn't move against it. Well, the not because I'm not the peace and love, you know, we're going to do this. That's just nonsense. What it is is that they didn't have the privilege. But, but at least I understand. So, okay, now I understand why they didn't move. At least it looks like that's why they didn't move the first. But what changed? That's what I want. I have no idea. Public pressure. Yeah. Mm. Well, from, from outside this province from other places. Even, even from a legal perspective, uh, he was exposing himself to liability. So he did, he wasn't making good decisions when he did. Well, the press painted him as being the reasonable one. Oh, they that's always do. Part that he always plays. Plays. That's, his, that's his claim to fame. Well, you mean, but after when, they, when he went in as well? After he went in, there, there was a couple of stories that appeared in national media. For example, the National Post wrote about it. And the interview. Enough and, is enough, kind of stuff. Uh, yeah, he said, "Enough is enough. I've been more than an, than reasonable." That his words, and he basically painted the the movement as you know people who weren't doing anything. They were they hadn't accomplished anything. They were just sitting there all for three months. And doesn't this offend? It's all smoke and mirrors. He yeah. hadn't been perfectly reasonable. He had been in a position for three months where he didn't have a bylaw which allowed him to move in. So he didn't move in, but he's got to, you know, pretty it up and, 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 and take the position he's being, it wasn't being reasonable. He didn't have the lawful authority for those three months to move in against. That's, I, I really find it deeply offensive how, why do people have to deal with this in such a, why, is, why does that have to be a spin, you know? I mean, why can't you just come clean and say, you know, to be honest, we've got a problem with our bylaw. We've got a problem with our bylaw, and it's not clear we can move against these guys. We're going to fix the bylaw, then we'll do Why not? We probably would have accepted that, especially because we kept, we kept saying that we would have rather worked this out through the courts. Well, and, just and, and of course, even without the bylaw, he could have gone to court, and he could have given you an opportunity to address the court and say, what, you know, and while we're living in a society, you know, everything is spin, everything is putting a, you know, uh, uh, I don't know, there's some kind of faking in all of this, which is just deeply troubling. You know, and, but, anyways, don't, it's not, 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 not. <laughs> Anyways, too bad, we, and the weather is on their side, too, is it? <laughs> Because 